Okay, I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the Quincy School Committee of Wednesday, October 11th. Again, I apologize for my voice, but I think you can hear me. Please stand for the pledge. Please remain standing and keep in your prayers the safety and well-being of our students and staff and those that have been put in harm's way around the world. Also, I refer to the superintendent for a memorial. Thank you and good evening, everyone. If everyone could keep in their thoughts and prayers, the family of Mary Mulligan. Uh, Mary is the mother of former school committee member and current city councilor, Anne Mahoney. Again, if you can keep um, Mary Mulligan and her family in your prayers and thoughts. Thank you. Superintendent, please call the roll. Mr. Bergoli. Present. Mrs. Cahill. Present. Mr. Gatro. Present. Mrs. Hubley. Present. Mrs. Lebo. Present. Mrs. Santoro. Present. Mayor Koch. Present. I would also like to introduce to you tonight our Quincy High School Student Representative Devereaux Fuller. And Devereaux, if you could just say you're present. Thank you, okay. And with us again for uh, North Quincy High representation, student representation is Amy Tan. Thank you. Mrs. Owens, would you please read the recording statement? Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Thank you. I'm seeking approval of the minutes of the regular meeting, September 27th. On a motion to Mrs. Hubley, seconded by Mr. Bergoli. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Mrs. Owens, I'll call upon you one more time. Open Forum is an opportunity for community input regarding the Quincy Public Schools. Community in this context is defined as a resident of the City of Quincy, a parent of a student who attends the Quincy Public Schools, or an employee of the Quincy Public Schools. Non-community persons not permitted to speak at Open Forum may submit written statements to the school committee. After giving his or her name and address, each speaker may make a presentation of no more than four minutes to the school committee an individual may not exchange their time or yield to others. Interested parties may also submit written statements to QSC Open Forum at QuincyPublicSchools.com. Okay, do we have anybody for Open Forum? If so, the microphone to the left, my right left. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Julie Triel. I live at 336 Granite Street. I have a four-year-old son who currently attends Della Chiesa and two Della Chiesa graduates, class of 2021 and 2023. This is my fourth consecutive year as a Della parent and my four-year-old son first taste of school ever. He has successfully transitioned from being a full-time at home with me to his part-time preschool program, all thanks to the amazing teachers and supporting staff at Della Chiesa. I'm strongly concerned about the potential mid-year move. Not only my son, but all his class teachers, especially those who walk to school at their own lowest and sweet. If we should strive on consistency and weekly schedules, we should feel the patient value of this, which is vital to all students' academic development. To disrupt this mid-school year is a recipe for disaster. Please not only pray for my son, but for all students who are Thank you. Do we have anybody else for open forum? Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, my name is Min Tay. I live at 197 Federal Ave. And uh, 
Uh, I also have Julio from the Atlanta Fidelis Piesa. Uh, since school began last year, he has thrived socially and academically. He's a passion for the future and is a wonderful passion. We are concerned that students and teachers will be doing this year rather than March 7th and September. This could be a difficult transition for uh, teachers and students, uh, particularly those who are watching school and see this as a um, We're very pleased with how CCF has uh, supported our child. Thank you. Hi, my name is Courtney Perdios, and I live at 86 Ruggles Street in Quincy Point. I just wanted to add my voice to the parents who have spoken here tonight and others who reached out to me directly. I really do think the Special Ed Center is a great idea. It's going to save kids from having to sit on the bus for hours a day traveling to faraway schools. It's going to allow students and families to build friendships and community right here in their backyard. And it's gonna save the city a lot of money that's currently going to out of district tuition and transportation costs. But this is absolutely something that cannot be rushed. You've heard tonight how disconnected parents are feeling from the process already. Whether this building succeeds or fails lies in the details. And there needs to be enough time to consider, evaluate, and work out all of those details. There needs to be enough time in the process for families' concerns to be addressed, time for teachers who are transitioning to the new building to get any additional training they may need, and time to hire new staff members that we will surely need as we invite our older students back from their auto district placements. Having a ribbon cutting ceremony in two weeks when the plans inside the building are not solid yet, when families haven't met with leadership yet, when teachers haven't had the chance to fully process what a mid-year transition might look like, and when we haven't even gotten approval yet from the state to bring our out-of-district students back into the building, seems impulsive, political, and rushed to families who are caring who, for who, sorry, caring for their special needs children is their whole life. So I again urge you to slow the train down and take the time necessary to work collaboratively and intentionally so the programming in that building is solid for these most vulnerable children in our city. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else for open forum? No one else? I love you. Hi, my name is William O'Neill. I was just here last week. I just want to thank the people I met earlier. And anyone running for election is more than welcome to stop by my house, have a cup of coffee, discuss, because this is a great school system when I grew up. It was good for my kids. And I want to see Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Anybody else for open forum? My name is Vanessa Scarnese. I live at 57 North Bayfield Road. And I wasn't going to get up and speak, so I don't have anything written. But I just want to say I have a four-year-old at De La Chiesa, um, speci specifically in the CARES program. And whether or not I agree with the Learning Center doesn't matter. My main concern is moving specifically these kids as early as January. My daughter started there almost a year ago and um, didn't speak, couldn't even get her into school, um, basically couldn't function. Um, she's now speaking full sentences, and that's, I'd say, 95% because of the people at Della. She goes to school happy. If we drive anywhere near her school, she asks to go see her teacher. It does not matter what day, time it is. It could be 10 o'clock at night. And she's asking to go see Miss Colleen and Miss Gary. Um, I think in the middle of the school year, moving would not only hurt these kids, but I can say for my child, will 100% make her regress. Um, and that is a really scary thought from where we've come a year ago. A year ago, I told my daughter would probably never speak. Um, and to think about the regression that could happen in a mid-year move when these three, four, five-year-olds have no idea what's going on, and we're just going to throw them in a new school with new teachers, even if their current teachers are there, I think is crazy. Um, if nothing else comes from talking more about this learning center, 
I think you guys should take a real look at moving kids in the middle of the year, especially that young, who can't understand. They're not 12, 13, 14 year olds that you can tell, hey, you're gonna go to a new school, and they're gonna go, oh, all right. These are three and four year olds who thrive on being in the same building every day, who thrive on a routine, who thrive on very much doing the same thing every single day. Um, and that's what most of the CARES program is. It's a, it, it's a group of mostly autistic children, and that's how they thrive. And my main concern is all of these kids, or a lot of these kids regress it over such a huge change when they can't even handle a breakfast or lunch at a different time, never mind a whole new building with all new people. Um, so I just want to say I really hope you guys take a really hard look at moving children mid-year and think about what that's going to do to the kids, regardless of your plan. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else for open forum? This is Owens. This letter uh, was sent by Christina Duncan, uh, a Snug Harbor parent, to whom it may concern. I first want to acknowledge that I understand there will be a school committee meeting tonight based on the new De Cristofaro Learning Center and a special education parent advisory council meeting tomorrow. I, however, wanted to express my concerns ahead of tonight's meeting. I am not a preschool or CARES parent, However, I have several friends who are caregivers to kids in both of these programs and or out of district programs. I hear the same concerns from both families and staff in these programs, the major one being communication. Not everyone has the ability to attend meetings or even listen to meetings after the fact. Families and staff have been blindsided by the information to come out. We need to work together to break down the barriers that are in the way for more families to be involved. Times of meetings, translation services, et cetera, need to be addressed. Many Della families only knew of changes based on Mayor Koch's QATV appearance on October 3rd. This information should have been provided prior to this school year, even without exact dates. On the Quincy Public Schools Facebook post, there was a comment that more details will come in the coming months, but if we are looking to add kids starting the beginning of the new year, these details should already be out. IEPs are legal documents. Caregivers under law have the right to voice their concerns. Time will be needed to time will need to be made to address each student's IEP in each family's native language. Please think about how you provide information to families, clear and concise language, as well as information translated. Please do not just rely on social media and or email. Thank you, Mrs. Owens. Okay, superintendent's report, chairman's report, Mayor Coke. I know we've got a couple of uh, big um, presentations tonight, so I'm gonna. Skip that part. Okay, thank you. We move to um, open October 1st enrollment. Superintendent. Thank you and good evening again, everyone. Uh, the QPS October 1st enrollment class size uh, data was shared with you at your um, places and they're in your packets tonight. I do want to just highlight some of the data uh, which is included in your packet. Before I do, obviously, I want to thank obviously Laura Owens for compiling this information and keeping track of this information uh, throughout the school year and keeping us up to date on our enrollment numbers. So thank you, Laura, for your hard work on that. Um, the official October 1st enrollment number for QPS is currently 9,930 students, which is an increase of 96 students from October 1st of 2022. Uh, since October 1st, 21 students have completed registration and another 40 students have registrations pending. So QPS enrollment will likely reach 10,000 students again later this school year. Uh, the last page of the document has a breakdown of new registrations and transferring students by level for the 2022-2023 school year to provide insight into the administrative workload related to the over 2,000 transactions into and out of the school system. So I do want to make sure I thank all of our clerical staff and all of our schools uh, and also our central registration staff at Quincy High School for working tirelessly over the summer and into the school year, making sure that our students are registered and in many cases transferred um, to other um, schools um, as well. So there's, there's that component as well. Not to mention the 700 students that, um, that the, um, the school system um, has helped um, place uh, either in other school systems or uh, graduates as well. Uh, the elementary class size average for kindergarten through grade five, I'm very happy to report thanks to the efforts 
of the mayor and school committee is very favorable at 19 students. As you know, we pride ourselves on our class size and this body and the mayor work uh, each, uh, very, very, very hard every year to make sure that our class sizes are, are very reasonable and make sure they give us the funding and the staffing to make that happen. Similarly, for grades six through eight core curriculum classes, 83.1% of classes have 24 or fewer students, which is amazing. The low end of the school committee's class size range. And no class sections are above 27 students, which is great. Uh, for, gra for grades nine through 12 core cur curriculum classes, 84.4% of classes have 25 or fewer students, an increase of 3% over last year, which is great. And again, thanks to the additional positions added at North Quincy for this school year, there are 16 fewer sections with class sizes between 26 and 28 students, uh, as opposed to last year, which you know those numbers were, were very high. And that's why we uh, dedicated so many staff members to North Quincy High School this year uh, to make sure those numbers were uh, reduced. 11 sections are above 28 students. Most are honors or advanced. And this is also a reduction from last year. So again, thank you for the additional funding and additional staffing which made that possible. Detailed class size information at the school level will be shared during the school improvement plan presentations in November by all of our principals. And further discussion about that can uh, happen with them in the subcommittee meetings as well. Uh, and again, I just want to make sure I, I thank all of our clerical staff for the hard work that they do uh, year in and year out for the Quincy Public Schools. I didn't know if anyone had any questions before I move on. I'm, I'm looking at the middle school um, class sizes, and I see that I don't. That you're not telling me about at Central what those what those classes are. Those 15 with 26 kids in it. Which page? So, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. I'm sorry. So if you look at the um, the 15 classes with 26 students in it at Central, it, there's no there's no code on the right that says what those classes are. But the 26. Right they have 26, yeah, yeah, there's 26, there's 10 at Atlantic and 15 at Central that each have 26 students. I can provide you so with a breakdown of what those classes are. I mean, you, you did, I think, for the 10, right? Yes, for the 27 and 28, yes. Okay. Yeah, I would be interested in seeing those cl class sizes look pretty large to me. I mean, I, I know that. We try, and right. 24 and, or fewer yes. students is... Both, both of those schools have very large sixth grades, and so yeah. I'm assuming that that's where the... That may be where they fall, but I can get, get, definitely get you that well, information. Uh, which, which brings me to my second question. I was surprised to see that Central brought in so many six, 16 kids to out of district that were not siblings in the sixth grade. No, they were... Most of them were siblings. They were siblings? <laughs> most of them. The not all, but 13 of the 16 were siblings. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I take it back. Ten of the 13. 13. 13 were granted, and 10 of them were siblings. Okay, I'm good then. Yes. Okay. How, so how many of our schools, Mr. Superintendent, are at or near capacity? Uh, Central is at or near capacity. Montclair is at or near capacity. Um... Beachwood Knowles at or near capacity. Um, Atlantic, Atlantic is probably at or near capacity. And Lincoln Hancock. So in Lincoln Hancock. Yeah. Five. And, and, the, and the trends for growth in those districts have been consistently up, trending up. It's yes. consistent. Yes. Mm. Yes. And Marshall has regained. Marshall is almost back to where it was pre COVID. Yeah. There was a shift of about 50 students to Lincoln Hancock. Yep. Yeah. But now both of the schools are in the mid-500 yeah, range. Big numbers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I'm happy to report that we recently were notified that 13 members of the class of 2023 are commended National Merit Scholars. These students are being invited to be recognized at the no no November 15th school committee me meeting. I do want to obviously congratulate them now, but we'll have a uh, greater presentation for you for these 13 amazing scholars that will come to us on November 15th. So we're looking forward to that. Next is the upcoming Quincy Public Schools in City of Quincy events. Uh, the, Rich, the Dr. Rich, Rick De Cristofaro Learning Center dedication will be Sunday, October 22nd at 1 p.m., followed by an open house and building tours at 2 p.m. And that's for anyone interested in, um, in the Learning Center School for their children. Uh, the Massachusetts Instrumental and Choral Conductors Association are hosting the statewide marching band competition 
at Veterans Memorial Stadium on Sunday, October 29th at 11 a.m. Over 20, over 20 high school and regional marching bands are scheduled to perform, including the Quincy North Quincy High School Combined School Marching Band and Color Guard. So good luck to our team uh, participating in that event. Uh, the Quincy Special Education Parent Advisory Council is hosting the third annual Trunk or Treat on Sunday, October 29th from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. in the Wallison School parking lot. So anyone uh, interested in attending that event, please do so. It's a great event. And lastly, the Holiday Shopping Expo hosted by the North Quincy High School Parent Advisory Council will be held on Saturday, November 11th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. at North Quincy High School. With that, that concludes the superintendent's report. We have the Dr. Rick DeCristofaro Learning Center update with us tonight. We have Mr. Hines, Mr. Kerwin, Ms. Perkins, and the superintendent to present. Good evening again, and thank you. Um, and I just want to uh, recognize and thank Mr. Hines and Mr. Kerwin, and of course, our assistant superintendent, Aaron Perkins, for presenting tonight. Um, I think you'll see uh, an, a very, very impressive school, uh, a state-of-the-art facility for our students, um, our special needs students, particularly our students with autism. And I'm very um, proud and honored to introduce to you assistant superintendent, Aaron Perkins. Um, are you kicking it off, or is Mr. Hines? Mr. Hines, you're kicking it off. Okay. So please go right ahead. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for having us here. As you know, I'm Commissioner Paul Hines from the Department of Public Buildings, and the superintendent said this is Thomas Kerwin, and you all know Erin Perkins, the assistant superintendent. Um, thank you for having us tonight. Uh, we're excited to have been engaged in this process, and we're excited to present it to you. Uh, when we did a similar presentation last week or 10 days or so ago to the Quincy City Council, uh, I described how I like my job. It's varied. We do different things every day. Some days, like today, is particularly stressful, but by and large, it's, it's a good experience. But this project is unique of any of the others we have done. You know, we, we finish a building, we turn it over, we walk away, people do what they do. Uh, I described it as that last meeting to the council that this is a job that I use my, my back, we lift things, we, we shovel, we hammer. I use my brain, I use my law degree, but in, in this case, with this project, I use my heart. And after listening to the council presentation, everybody that presented and everybody that spoke, I think that was a common element amongst them all. It was not unique to me. You could really see the passion in the people who discussed the project and its implications, not only for the school system and the school committee and the city budget, but more importantly for the, for the families. You know, it's the logical thing to do, it's the smart thing to do, but really it's the right thing to do by these families. And we're just very excited for that. To, to know what for you know future generations what's going to go on in that building is, is just something we'll always you know take with us and, and be thankful for. So the building itself uh, is laid out over three stories, um, divided by the architects uh, Westling Associates uh, in Quincy now from Braintree, um, and they were phenomenal Westling. They brought great expertise um, in style and color and layout and their educational background. Uh, but their passion as well. It's amazing. The building is divided up into learning neighborhoods. It's color coordinated, differentiated colors in different areas for the different age groups, the different programs. There's the mix of the classrooms, the Claire classrooms, and the incorporated classrooms uh, throughout. Um, and it's just really a great layout. And the building itself is unique to us in that we had to think further than anyone else that we did. Uh, because of the, the particular needs of these students with autism uh, who would be, you know, educated in this facility. We made ourselves aware of distractions and stimulations, both good and bad, for the students, certainly through the, the input of Erin and, and her team, uh, but by other consultants as well. You know, in just simple things, we realized how noise can be such a distraction for a child with aut autism, all of us, but particularly children with autism. So we made certain not to have any operating mechanical equipment above the classroom ceilings. There's not one classroom with the mechanical in the ceiling. They're all in the hallways or over the bathrooms to keep that noise level down. We did a heightened level of sound absorption in each classroom. The ceiling tiles, the sound panels on the walls, um, double thickness of the drywall on the walls, insulation in the walls between every classroom to keep the sound in and deaden what sound there is. 
to help to keep that the most positive learning environment as possible. Uh, the lighting systems have varying degrees of uh, adjustment, the lighting levels for particular needs. So uh, if there's sensitivities or whatever, it's not all on, all off. Um, so it, it really came together and it's amazing, amazing space. <clears throat> I think as far as the layout of the building, we've gone through it before with you, um, but you can enter either from uh, Old Colony Avenue or the backside, which is the, the shared parking behind. Both entities uh, enter into the common center lobby that you can see on your diagram. When we discuss the, the layout of the building, you see on your screen or your papers, to the left side, it's kind of an angled building oriented to the street. Uh, that's the building we all have come to refer to building A. The building to the right that's more square and more proximate to St. Anne's Road, uh, that is what we refer to uh, as building B. So on the first floor you walk in, you've got your reception station, the principal's office, the nurse's office, the conference room, your traditional academic and uh, academic support and administrative offices. But there's also a mix in building B of classroom space uh, and back of house uh, operations with a food service and things like that. And on building A on this level is by and large uh, classrooms, but there's also parent, parent uh, resource room and other support services rooms. Um, next, thank you. The next one, uh, similarly laid out, they pretty much stack above one another. Uh, what had been an open atrium when we purchased the building between the first and second floor lobbies were infilled uh, for a couple of reasons. One, fire code purposes. One, you know, safety of the students. And third, it created a large common multi-purpose room uh, in the center of these two wings of the building that uh, can be used for varying programs that Erin and her team uh, had planned and she will discuss tonight. Um, we also knocked down part of the building and put a new addition on uh, the upper portion what you're looking at of building B uh, to allow a large footprint for a cafeteria and multi-purpose room, professional development room. And adjacent to that is a, a full service industrial kitchen. Uh, many of the schools, uh, the school lunches are brought in and heated and served uh, I know the school uh, food services department is trying to get away from that model. But even independent of that, this one was planned with a full kitchen uh, because it's anticipated that if, even if not right away, this will ramp up and become a 12-month-a-year program. Um, so food can be prepared on site uh, for the needs of the particular students. Uh, we're anticipating heightened dietary restrictions and needs, uh, whether it be consistencies of foods or, or allergens or whatever. So that allows a dedicated staff on a much smaller scale to prepare the lunches than the larger preparation that goes on in the centralized uh, locations that do now. Um, every classroom in this building has a bathroom in it. Um, it was done, I will say, I was at first kicked and dragged to, to go along with it, uh, but I realized the, the wisdom of it um, and, and truly the need for it. Uh, that allowed us to shrink some of the gang bathrooms and distribute throughout the building, which makes it a better experience for the students in the classrooms, but also the teachers and paras that are in the classrooms because they can stay in the room, not have to take a student down to a common bathroom, uh, and the staffing remains in the room, uh, and it's less, less of a disruption uh, for the overall environment in the room. So this is the third floor level, which is kind of a level in a quarter. It's not a full third story in the whole building. Uh, again, it's building A to your left, classroom space, and uh, the, the life skills section that, that everyone will speak to. But it also, what is over the building B section is a large room that uh, is a, a gymnasium. You know, it's not the size of a, a common school gymnasium. We're restricted geographically by the structure, but also it, it's really kind of more of a, a motor skills development space than, a, you know, a full gymnasium. Uh, it will have basketball backboards and and baskets that are adjustable for height for the different ages of the students. Um, you know, and speaking to the spirit and the, and the dedication to the project that I spoke of earlier, Carl Antonio, who's the general contractor who's just been amazing on this job, uh, they got in the spirit of their, at themselves and they've donated the basketball equipment, the backboards and the, and the baskets and the installation, the electronics, uh, which is a pretty sizable sum. Um, but they just wanted to partake in part of what was going on here. Um, in the center, what had been the open atrium as well, is another multi-purpose room. 
Uh, Aaron again will speak to the program. They plan on it, but it's a large footprint. This has a two, or two and a half story atrium type uh, A-frame roof, high story windows around it. It's just flooded with light. It's really an amazing space that uh, would just be great for all the children there. So we have in the past shown you renderings of the building, uh, and we thought we'd kind of show you the rendering versus the reality. So the first of each of these slides is what the architects had come up with with their uh, computer-assisted programming, and followed by a slide that's an actual photograph today. So the first one was the entrance from Oak Holland Avenue rendering, and this is how it looks today. Um, this is, again, the front of the building, but as if traveling down uh, Oak Island Avenue and the train tracks to your right and the school to your left. Uh, this is how you're approaching and in the far distance would be St. Anne Road. So that's the rendering and that's the reality. Um, the trees kind of throw it off a little bit and I think the photographer was a little short so the angle is off. Um, but it shows the coloring, the windows, the graphics. Uh, the graphics you'll notice, they're kind of muted and they're more kind of uh, abstract of what they represent, but uh, they carry to the outside the themes of the inside. The neighborhoods, again, to be expressed in some of the paperwork, but there's some that have to do with farmland, some that have to do with the ocean. And so the graphics on here, and you will see on the back of the building, bring that theme outside and introduce it and, uh, and, and give the building some life. You know, we all looked at it, it was the old office building. It was really kind of sleepy and dark and kind of boring. Uh, and one of the things Westling did was envision the building, giving it some pop and waking it up um, to be, you know, a happy, fun, exciting place to be, and uh, it really looks fantastic. So this is the rendering of the back entrance from the common shared uh, parking area. You'll see to the left, you now everything's reversed. To the left in this image is building B with that cafeteria area that we built. And that's got the, the graphics on the outside. And you'll see on ground level along that side is the playground, the structured playground that we built uh, for this facility. Uh, the playground is divided by two different sections for age groups. So the, and the equipment in there are age appropriate. Um, and to create the floor print or the, the ground space for that playground, last summer we did shift the parking lot of Central Middle School. We, we dug it up, moved it over, I think about 20, 25 feet, uh, and created space, uh, added space, parking spaces at Central, but then created the, the footprint for this playground. And this is as it looks today. Uh, actually, last week, the crane is gone. Um, so you see it, it's really true to uh, what the vision uh, is, is the reality. This is the back of the building, and primarily building B coming down St. Anne Road. Uh, and so Central Middle School is on your right in this, this imagery. Uh, and that's where you face. And that's, uh, that's the reality of it. The playground there uh, and the building with the graphics to, uh, again, uh, make the the playground area a little more fun, but to carry the themes outside for the children as well. You'll see some familiar images and colors. Uh, the playground does have these sun shelters, but in addition, on the far end of the, the playground, there's a very large, probably a 20 inch diameter oak tree that will provide shade. And we've also planted some, uh, some trees around the perimeter that when they uh, get larger and cast a shadow on the playground will give, of course, shade to the, uh, the kids that are out there. So now we're starting to, these aren't renderings. These are actually what you see in the building today. So this is a view down one of the corridors of the classroom sections. Uh, you'll see the cubbies on the, uh, the walls in the corridors. There's some sections of the buildings where those cubbies are within the classroom. And if that first section, the cubbies on your left, if the far cubby, you'll see there's like a box in there that matches the color of the cubby. Uh, and those, each section of the cubbies have them and, you know, people like, everyone's trying to figure out what they were, if they're stepping stools or whatever. Uh, but what they are, in fact, is a box that can be laid flat within the cubby, and it makes that particular cubby ADA compliant. So you get a child in a chair, they don't have to reach as far down uh, to get their backpack or whatever they may have put in, in the cubby. So they're throughout the building and all the sections of cubbies, and they're movable between them as needed and where needed. This is a view. It's, it's kind of a scrunch looking with the, with the lens, but this is the cafeteria section. It's much larger than what this uh, imagery really kind of portrays. Uh, it's, it's flooded with light. The windows are on your right in this image. Um, it's quite long. It's, uh, this is a photograph here is looking if the kitchen were to your back. Uh, so it's kind of deceptive in the angling of it, but it's a very large space and nice and bright, uh, plenty of sun. 
This is a typical classroom. Uh, this one would be in building A. Uh, looking off, uh, if you look down on the left out of those classroom windows, it would be the campus kinder house. Uh, and the, the buildings in your right, uh, the, excuse me, the windows in your right would be out towards the central middle school and the common parking lot. This is another typical classroom, I believe. This is down in the area closer to the center where the resource area was. Um, and you see the shine on the floor and things like that. Uh, and then I'll take this opportunity to speak to the finishes in the building and some of the other considerations we had to do for this building and with this community. Um, realizing it's a 12 month a year program, realizing what the custodians and others do in the schools over the summer when the other school buildings are closed, uh, they won't have that opportunity in this building. So we had to go for maintenance free as much as we could or maintenance minimum as much as we could in these building finishes. So these floors are actually a sheet vinyl rather than the vinyl tile or, or carpet that you'll see in some of the other classrooms. Um, this maintenance requires a broom and a, a damp mop. There's no stripping, there's no waxing. So that helps to uh, keep the place available to people, but it also helps to not introduce the smell of harsh chemicals uh, and other compounds and the VOCs into the space. Um, the lobby floor, when you see the lobby floor, you know, you'll see it in all the airports, so that's about the only other place you see it now, but that floor is terrazzo, which is very, very durable. Uh, it's more expensive than more common floors, and that's why it's not as common. Uh, but in the long run, uh, its maintenance uh, requirements and its durability, it'll pay for itself tenfold and uh, will always look great. This is another classroom. Um, I don't know if this is an A or B, but it's typical of them. And you'll see the varying colors as you go. You keep flipping through them. Yeah, if anything jumps out. Um, it should, if you go through them, you'll see the next one. Uh, this is upstairs on the third floor in that half section over building B. This is what I referred to earlier as being the gymnasium and the, and the motor skills room. Uh, so it's got skylights up through the roof, uh, so it brings in some natural daylight there. And uh, they're not windows that are down low and can be a, a problem with, you know, things getting caught in the ledges or windows breaking, things like that. And the flooring looks like it's a hardwood floor. Um, so it, it gives that warmth in the family home that everyone likes with the wood floors. But this is a padded vinyl product that's made for this type of athletic use room. So it's not one that requires the stripping in the poly like we do in the other gymnasiums. Um, same thing, it's a broom in a wet mop maintenance. Uh, but it is padded to allow, uh, you know, comfort underfoot when running around. Um, again, it's, it, this will have the baskets and stuff, but it, it won't be full court basketball. But it'd be, uh, it'll be great for, for development of skills and, and other coordination development. This here is a photograph of that third floor atrium space that I referred to earlier, where it's like the two, two and a half story, clear story uh, height. So to your right in this photograph are the car two corridors that go down to the gymnasium space. Uh, this is the common uh, multi-purpose area between building A and building B, the third floor level of it. Um, this is over in building B, one of the other classroom areas. You see the difference in the color of the uh, interior finishes. Again, it's done to help identify for the students who perhaps can't read the signs or, or other issues with uh, identifying their locations. The color is something that uh, is, is uh, recognized by them and helps them uh, to, to find their way in the wayfinding. All right, so this is where it kicks into to, uh, to Aaron, but there's one other thing I want to speak to it. On the building, um, the, the building code required one elevator. We had that, we reconditioned it. But we thought about the student population, the students with autism and other people in this building, the number of staff, needed to attend to the, the, to the students. Um, we wanted to make sure that if there were a need for an urgent evacuation of the building, that we're all not bottlenecked in the lobby trying to get that one elevator and go down. So we actually did two additional. So there's a total of three elevators in the building. Uh, the building's designed uh, for a student population of 350 plus staff. Um, so we did the three elevators. One elevator down at the St. Anne Road end, its primary function is the freight elevator for the food services, which the kitchen and the cafeteria, as we said, are on the second floor. But in an emergency situation, that elevator is designated to evacuate the second floor of building B. Uh, over in that common area, the 
the, the multi-purpose rooms and the connecting link between the two buildings is the original elevator. And that's designated that will evacuate the gymnasium area and the third floor of building A. And they'll have sole use of that elevator. The new elevator that we installed into building A, you know, accesses all three floors, but an emergent situation would be designated to evacuate building, building A level two. And of course, the first floor of either side goes out there, you know, the first grade, first floor on grade exits to help expedite what will hopefully never be needed. But um, so with that, I will finish up. I'll let uh, Aaron speak to programming and things like that. Uh, and I will give a brief recap of the finances in lieu of Eric Mason. So you might actually be able to understand it. <laughs> thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you very much for um, having us here tonight to talk about the Learning Center. As Paul mentioned when he uh, talked about that this was, you know, something that everyone has put their heart into, this is obviously something that I, I, for those of you that know my background being in special education my entire career, um, you know, this is something I feel extremely passionately about. I think that it's a wonderful, wonderful thing for the city of Quincy and for our community and for the families in our community. And I am very excited to continue working throughout the course of this year um, and beyond to make this a place that everybody wants to come. And, and um, we're absolutely committed to that. I know I speak with the superintendent, for the superintendent as well, that we, um, we want to work with our families and we want this to be a place that people are excited to be in and want to um, participate. So the design of the building um, is designed on, as Paul mentioned, learning neighborhoods. So they're um, developmentally appropriate for each grade level. They are separate uh, within the building. So pre-K is separate from students um, that would be in the CARES program in the older grades. So kindergarten uh, in grade two are in one learning neighborhood. Students in grades three to five are in another learning neighborhood. And students in grades six to eight are in a different learning neighborhood. As Paul mentioned, he talked, to, I won't go into the colors. Paul did a great job talking about the colors. But the colors are absolutely gorgeous. Um, and you know, hopefully you'll come to see it soon and you will just see just absolutely how beautiful the building is. Um, in addition to the classrooms, the other thing that we're very, very proud of is that um, there are multiple therapy spaces throughout the building. So pretty much each wing of the building, you have your choice of therapy spaces. So there's areas for speech, there's areas for OTPT. Um, Paul showed you, you know, the gymnasium for the adaptive physical education. There's a music therapy room. Uh, there's a sensory room. There's a calming room. Um, there are lots and lots of spaces to be able to work with students individually or in small group, um, whatever is, you know, required in, at the time. There's also uh, something that I absolutely love, and you may find me there um, at, at different times, is the life skills classroom. Having been a middle school, substantially separate special education teacher, this is something that's near and dear to my heart. And uh, the thing that I really like about this room is that it's separate from the classroom. So you can have a classroom lesson um, and, you know, be covering whatever you're covering, you know, math or ELA or whatever. And then you want to take your students, you know, in to do a life skills lesson. It's set up like a mock classroom. It has a washer dryer. It has a refrigerator. It has an electric uh, stove top. It also has a countertop area for um, like kind of workshop experiences where, so we could partner with some, you know, different organizations and perhaps do some pre-voke uh, skills with our students. So these are all things, you know, our goal, you know, in education and in particular in special education, we want our students to be as independent as possible in their own community. That is our goal. That is what we do every single day. We want them to be successful members of our community and being able to introduce leisure and recreation skills starting in sixth grade to get students ready and really work on those independent life skills is just so important and this space gives us a really great opportunity to do that. And then Paul mentioned the common um, dining area, which the picture did not do it justice. The, the room is absolutely amazing. It's huge. The light is stunning. Um, and the what's really exciting about this, and Paul talked about it a little bit, is the fact that we can really 
tailor um, our, our eating protocols, introduce new foods. We can really cater to um, our population and really try working on introducing, you know, um, different textures and different uh, smells and, you know, just all the things that, you know, kind of come along with um, getting kids to eat more as they get older. So just to show you um, what the furniture will look like in a classroom. We did have a team of educators that uh, worked with Julie Graham and Jen Leary on selecting the furniture. Um, they've worked, they were pretty much been working since last year on selecting the furniture. We had a furniture fair where the teachers were able to come and actually look at the furniture, touch the furniture, you know, see what they may or may not like. It was all adaptive um, furniture equipment. You know, there was some, you know, more standard for things like the pre-K classroom, but a lot of adaptive uh, types of furniture that we were able to actually see. And so they were, you know, able to decide what they thought would be appropriate, what they, what they really wanted to see in their classroom. And then, um, we did multiple iterations of these classroom designs so that they could actually see. Because initially, as any good teacher would do, you tell me I can have all this furniture. I want all of this furniture. Um, and so, you know, we went through multiple designs uh, of what actually would fit, what would work, what wouldn't work. Um, and so this is the end design for pre-kindergarten. This is for um, CARES kindergarten to grade two. A, and a lot of the, the choices for the furniture were also based on, you can see the table there. So that table, they come together, but they also separate. So you can do um, like discrete trials, one-to-one -one, uh, instruction if you need to. And then also lots, lots of like soft spaces for kids to sit um, in other you know, areas within the classroom for like movement. Uh, this is the for the CARES uh, in grades three to five. Again, and you can see as the students get older, you know, less toys, not so much in terms of kitchens and things like that, but still the idea of that flexible seating and the ability to move around the classroom. And then this is for CARES six to eight. Uh, again, you can see here, you can see the progression to the older classroom. You see the standing desks, um, you see the carousels in the back to work on discrete trials. Um, and so, you know, it just kind of progresses as the students move on throughout the grades. So just to talk a little bit about where we are in the process. So in terms of the pre-kindergarten program, um, there, so there's two different programs that will be going into this building. One is the pre-kindergarten program, and one is our CARES, some of our CARES students, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So once the construction is complete, the district will submit a notice of intent to relocate the pre-kindergarten program with the required documentation. And so that is things like occupancy permits, fire, inspection, um, all, you know, evacuation plan, things, things like that. Um, and then the Department of Education will approve. And we did have an initial site visit um, a week or two ago where they came. And that kind of starts the process of uh, application. But for the pre-kindergarten program, we are just relocating the program. It, it, it's not, we're not changing the model at all. So the model is not uh, changing, just the, the building is changing. So once approved by the Department of Education, the district will work with staff, students, and families to transition to the new building, and a final move date will be determined. We really appreciate the parents that came and spoke tonight and hear, you know, hearing the concerns and the feedback, and we will work with all of our families to make sure we're at, whenever we move, once the building is ready, that it's a smooth transition for everybody involved. Um, we do have tours that will begin soon for families and students. Um, we'll start those sometime in November after the dedication, and we do have a sign-up um, that's already, I think, been circulating. Um, and then we, we have a parent information session for the pre-kindergarten families um, that will be held virtually on Monday, October 23rd, and we did just send a letter out to the families with that information. Um, and then, in addition, I just want to thank the CPAC. I know Sarah uh, Woods is here as the uh, co-president of the CPAC. She's hosting, or they're hosting, a virtual question and answer session. And so myself and the superintendent will be present um, to answer any questions that parents may have. Uh, that's tomorrow, October 12th at 630. 
And um, uh, and as I already said, the programming, like in terms of the start and end times, those all will remain the same for the pre-kindergarten program. In terms of the CARES program, so our goal for this is to open uh, in, with the summer program for 2024. So um, we will, uh, in terms of who will be attending this program, I think, you know, there has been maybe some different um, things swirling there about who will be attending this program. So in order to attend the, the Richard de Cristofaro Learning Center, students will need to be ref re referred by their individual education team. So this it is not for every single student with autism. Um, you know, there will be many students with autism that continue to attend Snug Harbor or Squantum Elementary School, um, where we have our, our other CARES programs. This is in particular for students who have a level of need that is such that we would normally be recommending them for an out-of-district placement. Um, and so, you know, we will absolutely work with families. It's a conversation with families um, and, you know, a discussion about what's in the best interest of individual children, and it will be a, a team decision. So it will not, it's not that we're moving all of the care students from our um, public schools into the learning center. That, that's not happening. We are, we are in particular um, looking for an opportunity to provide our students with a, a great education in their home district when they would otherwise have been on a bus for an hour, an hour and a half, uh, back and forth to school. You know, that, those are the students that this building is, is in particular uh, targeted for. So families and students can absolutely participate in tours of the building beginning in November. Anyone's welcome to sign up, whether you have a student that will be attending uh, or not. And um, we are working on the initial application, and it must be submitted to DZ in the spring. And again, I want to thank the QPAC. We're, I'm working collaboratively with the QPAC on the initial application. We have formed a design team. Um, that will help, you know, review all the documents, build programming, things like that uh, for our st hopeful start date um, in, with the summer program. <clears throat> and so it, as I just mentioned, the design team, it will, it does, it includes parents, staff, and administrators, and um, we will be meeting once per month, and we'll be working, breaking down the tasks. There's a lot of tasks that go into an initial application for the Department of Education. And so we'll be breaking down those tasks um, into smaller groups and then sharing them with the larger groups to get them ready for, submis for submission to the Department of Education. Oops. I don't know what just happened. Um, so this is just a, a timeline that um, I created and I think I've shared with you. I think Ms. Owens provided you a copy, um, just a timeline of all the tasks. This is a fluid document, so this may change as we progress in the initial application process. Uh, and this is just a slide that just highlights right now um, the proposed start and end times. As I mentioned, the pre-kindergarten program, pre-kindergarten cares is not changing. That's remaining the same. We are proposing that the um, students who are participating in the cares program at the in the in grades K to eight that attend the uh, Richard de Cristofaro Learning Center that they start at 8.30 and end at 2.45, and we would like to do that so we separate them from the pre-K and also um, do, you know, for traffic reasons, just to make sure that, you know, we're getting kids in and out uh, in a timely manner. And um, the, the uh, as I mentioned, the neighborhoods are separate within the building, so, um, you know, I think having start and separate start and end times would be really beneficial for everybody involved. In the, um, in terms of partnerships, we have a couple of places that we're working this year um, on partnering with. Um, some we've already met with and we'll be doing some work. Um, and so Quincy Aftercare, uh, the superintendent and I met with um, Sarah a while ago to talk about potentially offering an inclusive after school um, care option for students. This also actually involves social autism too, because our thought is that we could work with Quincy Aftercare to provide really great programming. We could bus kids from other schools. 
I'm sure you know that Quincy Aftercare has a huge list, a uh, waiting list of people uh, to attend their program. So we could bus students there. We could have a, a really wonderful, inclusive after school program. And students could also get their beha- some of their su- behavior support, um, you know, things that are like are on their IEP or their behavior plans, um, their ABA services right within the after school program. So if we work together collaboratively to provide really well trained staff, um, and we work with places like social autism. I think that could be a really effective after school program. Uh, and then um, we have Sing, Explore, Create, which we have worked with now. And again, thank you to the CPAC for introducing that uh, to us, but during vacation. And so that's another organization that we'll be partnering with to provide camp opportunities during vacation weeks. Um, and Melmark, we've worked with them for a very long time, but they are continuing to provide programming support and professional development. And then new um, that we're meeting with soon is Curry College reached out to us when they heard about the Learning Center. They are very interested in partnering with us to provide intern- internship op- opportunities for prospective students who want to become special educators and who are in particular interested in working with students with autism and um, have an interest in that area. Area. So we think that would be, I think they have six already that are interested in, um, you know, working with us. So we're very excited about that potential opportunity. And then that okay. is the presentation. I think that's on, on Aaron's part. If you want to do our questions. That Q&A and, and thank you was on Aaron's portion. If you want to do uh, the Q&A with her now, I, I just do want to speak to the building schedule as well. So I'll do whatever format if you want. If you want to. Get the meats and potatoes. If what you're more interested in with Aaron, we can do that. Mr. Cattro. Uh, just three, uh, thank you for the presentation. Three categories of questions. So, how many out the students that we currently send out of district could be served here? Ideally, we're shooting for uh, anywhere between 30 to 50 students that, to we, that are from Quincy that currently yes. go 30 yes. to 50. Mm-hmm. And, and um, what's the capacity of the building? 350. 350. So, uh, and how many students that don't go out of district that are currently in QPS schools will be in the building, none? Uh, we'll have some, you know, some that are in in our CARES programs. I don't, I'm, I don't know off the top of my head that number, but we will have some, um, you know, that, that, I, that we do recommend attend. The, we would have maybe had it not been for the Learning Center, been recommending that they attend an out-of-district placement. And so instead of recommending that, we'll be recommending the Learning Center. So the vast majority vast majority yeah. of the student population here could be from other cities and towns? Well, so we also have the pre-K. So the pre-K counts in the 350 also. So, that? And that's about like 150-ish oh, um, okay. kids. Yeah. So um, that's a lot of kids. And because they're, uh, you know, a good amount of them are half day. So yeah. there's 15 and 15 and a.m. and a p.m. Mm-hmm. So that's 30 per classroom. Um, and so, th- so that accounts for a good amount of students. But we will also be able to tuition students in if we have room. Obviously, Quincy students are our first priority. But with when we apply for the initial um, ap- uh, approval, we'll have we will have to have a tuition policy as part of that approval. Thank you. Uh, second question, Aaron, could you explain if or how technology is currently used with this student population? Uh, I think one of probably the largest ways that it's used is as a communication device or a communication tool. Um, and so, you know, we will, all of the classrooms have interactive whiteboards. Um, in that addition... Was, that was my question for Mr. Hines because he didn't touch on technology mm-hmm. in the present. From a facility standpoint, can you talk through? Yeah, all of the classrooms have interactive whiteboards, which is absolutely amazing. And uh, we have about, we've ordered about 150 iPads um, that will be loaded with things like communication apps like ProLoco to Go, Touch Chat. There are all different um, apps that, you know, it depends on the student what's effective for that individual student. And, um, you know, I think that Jen Leary is here who has speech therapist background, but I think one of the things that is really exciting is um, we'll be able to trial communication devices with students. So that's something that, you know, we've struggled with in district, you know, is being able to have the number of devices to be able to actually trial with the student what is going to work most effectively for that student. And so we'll have 
a whole host of devices that will be able to with you know the whatever the apps are that are needed that will that will be already be loaded and ready to go that we can actually trial with students to see what's going to be the most effective tool for that individual child and, and final question uh, based on the testimony at open forum tonight is, is there a plan or will you meet in person and virtually with the Della Chiesa parents just to discuss the timing, some of their concerns, mm -hmm. and whether or not th that timing that we originally planned makes sense. Yes, we have a virtual meeting um, scheduled for Monday the 23rd. We don't have an in-person, but we certainly can schedule an in-person as well. Thank you. Thank you. This is Gail. I'm, I'm just going to piggyback a little bit on, on Doug's comment. Um, one. I just want to say the attention to detail in the building is amazing and, and, and it meets the needs of the students that we're going to serve. And, that, and you know, thank you to Paul's team for that because I'm sure as you're putting it together, you see the different things that you need to do. But, uh, but as far as the details in, inside the building and the education and the pieces there, um, you know, I'm sure that Erin and her team understand what the needs are in there. But I think um, I heard from a parent and as a school committee member, and as administrators, I think we need to let parents know that we're here to answer questions or be a liaison for them with the school system. And if parents have questions, if they, they have things that they don't think they're getting answers to or they have concerns, you know, contact us and let's have a communication and a conversation so that there's clear communication and there's not all kinds of things out there in the, in the universe that may be a clouding what's happening. Um, and I, th I have a question in regard to the communication with parents. Um, you know, the meeting, for an example, that's going to be tomorrow night, is there a link anywhere online? How are we getting that out to people? Is it, you know, I, I think we need multi-pronged communications with our parents. Not everyone's going to check their emails. Maybe a, a flyer in their backpack, um, a phone call and a message. Um, I just think that you know, I love what we're doing, and it's amazing, and we should all be super proud. And as parents and for our students, we should be really proud of the work that we're doing here. Um, but I do understand a little bit that we need to communicate and make sure that our, our parents and families understand what's coming their way and how beneficial it is going to be for them and their families and students. But it change is scary, and um, the best way to address that is to communicate. So I, I just wanted, you know, if we can be clear... Um, and make sure that they know where to go to get information. And, and also, a mom said to me that, you know, sometimes parents are afraid to call, that it's going to give a negative reflection on them and their, and their ch children, which I don't think is a reasonable thing to assume because um, that's why we're here. So um, I think that's really my, my, um, my only comment is really the communication piece. Okay. Thank you. Mrs. Hugh. <coughs> Thank you. Just to piggyback on what Mrs. Cahill just said, um, are we going to send out an instant alert kind of a message so parents can have the information on the meetings and where to get information on the links and stuff like that? Yep. So the meeting tomorrow is hosted by the CPAC. Mm -hmm. um, so that is on their flyer and their website, I believe. I'm pretty sure it's on the, the flyer and the website. Um, and we can certainly blast it out to the special education families. And the um, in terms of the one on Monday, the 23rd, we, we sent an email, but we absolutely can follow up with backpack, instant alert, you know, all of those, all of the different ways. And I, I don't think I mentioned that we are, Kelly Powers is actually also working on creating a website for the Victor Christopher Learning Center. And I think she's pretty close to ready to go live with that. So that will be another spot where we'll post, you know, any information. Okay, thank you. Um, also, so I just want to say I do love I love the um, the themes and the colors of the different neighborhoods. I think that's that's absolutely wonderful. Um, so, a couple of questions. So, fully air conditioned the whole building? Yes. Okay. Thought I heard that before, but I didn't hear it tonight. So, I just wanted to make sure I elaborated. Heard that. So, um, the windows. Um, I love the natural light, but do we have options for shades or blinds on some of the windows? I didn't see any in the pictures, and I know that can be a sensitivity to some of our students. Correct. Uh, yes, there are. Every, every window in the building has a roller shade, uh, just an imagery. They're all rolled up. Uh, and they do have the pull chain to operate them. And given concerns with safety in the building, 
those pull chains are in, in, in sheaves. Mm -hmm. So there's just about six or eight inches at the bottom that you got to kind of work. But they, every window has an operable shade. Um, and similarly, the doors. I mean, every classroom door has a vision panel, as you can see in the classrooms, the fire department and things like to do. But on the flip side, there's times when you want the privacy, if there's a lockdown or whatever, um, the doors are designed, they have a little shade on the door, and it pulls down and blocks that vision panel. A lot of times you go in school, there's middle of folders and poster boards and everything else taped to the doors, but in anticipation of that, there are these devices. Okay, great, thank you. And so um, what would be Ms. Perkins' um, response to parents who are concerned about the age range of the students in the building, and is this age range comparable to other um, schools that are similar to the school? It, it, it is. So, for instance, like South Shore Collaborative is has multiple um, ages, and um, they'll, they are in separate wings. They'll have separate start and end times. Um, so we are keeping them. They won't, you know, they won't really, you know, they'll be separate. So for the most part, like, in, when you when you go and see the building, I think you can see it really is a building A and a building B, and it's you know, separated by a big lobby in the middle. In the middle, so if you're in on you know the third floor in um, you know the A building or whatever it is, you are not anywhere near the preschool students. Which is so our older students are on the third floor, mm -hmm. and there's sensory, I mean, uh, therapy rooms, and there's no need really for um, them to kind of go down to the pre-kindergarten area. There's rooms and opportunities right on that floor, so. For instance, therapy rooms are every every wing has a therapy room. Okay, because I did notice in the picture that the um, the gym um, mo large motor room is is on the third floor. So would our preschool students not be going up to the third floor to use the gym? I have had parents that are that have expressed concern about that. Okay, so that yes, that room is on the third floor. But again, that's the only room on above building B on that third floor. Uh, one of the benefits of having that large central core, uh, multi-story atrium and in levels of we've now made it is if, if you're in that that common multi-purpose room on any of the levels you need the teacher's badge key to get into a wing so for several reasons one for security two you know there are some students who who can tend to take off on the teachers um, and it helps to keep that from from advancing beyond the reach of the teacher or whatever uh, and it also helps to keep the segment separate we did a tour uh, some months back when planning the new Squamish School out at the Boardwalk campus at Acton Box Boxborough. They had two completely distinct elementary schools in the same building. Separate administration, separate principals, separate everything. One floor is one school and a different name, second floor is another school. Mm -hmm. They share a common gymnasium and a common cafeteria. That is it. So this is... You know, in many ways, that same way. They're isolated areas, and they're segregated, and, and they're controlled. Okay. That leads me to my next question. Next, we have heard from parents about um, this is a very vulnerable population that we have, and safety and security is very important. And could you elaborate a little bit about safety protocols that we have in the schools for them? Sure. Um, the design of the building was done at all times with the people who do those designs. There was a safety consultant and such. Uh, in, including working uh, closely with Mike Vecchio on uh, a number of matters. Uh, the exterior of the building has full perimeter coverage with video cameras, recorded, recorded uh, data decks, as does the interior of the building. There's cameras everywhere. Um, so if there's an intruder, they can be identified by location. But that's one of the other benefits of having those segmented areas, kind of like the, uh, you know, the, the water chambers in a ship, uh, there's, there's safety zone type things. Um, do you limit your exposure and your access? Uh, there's communication devices from each classroom to the school office. Um, every teacher has a cell phone now. Um, and, uh, you know, at, at all times that was, that was brought in. You get into the, the exterior doors of the main entrance, there's an interior chamber. They call it a trap you know, in, the, in the business. The inside doors are locked. You've got visual sight lines to the reception desk and audio vid video communications. Before they're let in that second secured door, you know who they are and why they're there. Um, and once they're in the building, they're subject to every other Quincy Public School uh, visitor protocols and such. Uh, there's the first floor of building A, the parent resource area and things like that. Again, once you get out of the lobby and into that corridor leading into building A, 
um, there's another locked door. So the parent areas, the resource area, there's a, um, a meeting room and a conference room that is, again, outside of a secured door. So even parents that you let in to use those resources cannot get to the academic area. Okay, thank you very much. This is Lino. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for this. I am so, so pleased to see this. It's so exciting to have you know, kids who used to be put in the basement getting a school like this. This is absolutely beautiful. Um, I'm, th I'm thrilled. I really am thrilled. And I really I agree with them, my colleagues, about the parents' concerns. So I'm really glad that we're addressing that as much as we can. I have a, a question, though. I think, and this is, partly this is a cost thing, but more it's a function thing. You're going to need a different type of administration there. With this, I mean, I think we're going to need a principal. And we, I, I think, and you're going to need guidance. I mean, yeah. who's, you know, to your point that that other building, they had two, two principals. But we, we don't even have a, a principal position that we should have. Yeah, I think that that's something, obviously, we'll have to, you know, be speaking with the committee about. But and the other thing that, you know, we would um, like to see is to also have a full-time team administrator. So in addition to a principal, have a full-time team administrator located at that building, um, you know, I think would be, so basically that would be like two administrators. And we, our plan is to have two, at least two full-time BCBAs in the building as well. So, um you know, are we that, going to have our own? Are we going to bring? Are we going to have to bring outside oh, people in? I think we'd prefer to have our own and you know hire our own. Right now we contract, but we would prefer to have our own. Are we are we offering any kind of incentive to our folks to take that training? Or oh, um, the uh, well, the RBT is the, I think is what you're talking about. The para training is that what you're yep. talking about? So that's for para professionals, and yes, they do increase on the pay scale if they if they um, take the training, and we pay for the training, we pay for the certification, oh, um, we, we pay for all of it. So that's great. I do think at some point we're going to have to talk about that administrative cost because this is a real building. I mean, not that believe me, they're doing an incredible job over there, and that's a real building, and you guys do amazing work, as we've heard from every single parent. But I think it needs to be elevated up. I don't think it needs to be different people. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying we need to, we need to make this real. Thank you. Is there in, any impact from uh, campus Kindhouse with the traffic um, on a daily basis? Yes, uh, and quite obviously, Central Middle School is next door as well. Uh, both. Uh, facilities and, and populations were considered into the scheduling that Erin spoke to earlier about the, the, the staggered time for this building, but that also coordinates and, and dovetails with the, the, the fresh hour, we'll call it, or the more busy hours for Campus Kinderhouse and the schedule of the Central Middle School. Um, the way the facility, the Christopher Center is, is uh, designed, the parent pick up and drop off uh, their own personal vehicles would be along the front door in Old Colony Avenue. It's a very wide street, lots of on-street parking there. Uh, the buses and the van uh, for, the, for the other children uh, that use those services would be at the back door through that, that common driveway that's behind the building. Uh, we did define a column, uh, a drive column for all those, those vans uh, to separate them from the loop of traffic and it's fenced off for uh, safety of the students, but also to keep the flow of traffic going. And it, it happened after one day of me trying to get to it at a Christopher meeting outside school of school and one of the vans put the red sign out and Huckins Ave stopped. And I was like, ah, we're doing the same thing. So we made the divided barrier behind the Christopher Center. So even with the red signs out with the, the traffic island and the fence, the cars that are doing the loop and the pickup circle can still progress. They're not required to stop uh, to keep that traffic flow going. Um, in addition to take some of the pressure off those back doors, the St. Ian Road end of the building, um, there's doors there too that uh, designed to take four of the vans off the road as well at, at that end of the building and disperse that effort out. Uh, and obviously, you know, the, the the school department and Everett's team will determine who's assigned to where. Um, but that's that's how that works. In, in addition, uh, staffing uh, nurses uh, going to be there. How many nurses are we going to staff with? The, right now, we're planning for two nurses. Two, and they're going to be trained specifically to deal with uh, autism. Oh, yes, definitely. Okay. And have we hired them yet? Uh, not yet. But, I mean, the, some of them could be existing, um, already existing nurses that go there. We, have but, a pool. we also have a pool of substitute nurses who have expressed interest as well. 
So uh, obviously we'll work with Andrea Hewer to identify two great nurses for the building, but um, we, we do have a, um, we have uh, interested individuals who are highly qualified uh, that uh, could fit those roles. Thank you. Mr. Hines, did you want to finish? If I could, yes, thank you. Uh, a little recap, yeah. Uh, I wanted to touch on Mr. Guttrow's asked about the, uh, the technologies in the building. Uh, and that, again, was something that we're very mindful of. Every classroom is going digital. It's all going to the, the technologies. We learned that with COVID and, and with the school committee and the others we had to do in the classrooms to add capacity for Wi-Fi capabilities and such. Uh, anticipating that future use and the current use, is, as Evan described, with the, with the Chromebooks and everything else, uh, for the communication devices, that's only going to grow. So this building has probably four times the access points and the other data capacities that a standard building would have. There's access points everywhere. There's data ports in the wall everywhere. Um, every classroom, as Aaron said, has there's the smart boards, the walls. Every classroom has the assisted listening devices, the gymnasium, the motor skills, the common areas. They all have the assisted listening devices. Uh, the cafeteria has it. Um, there's communication boards. Uh, it's, it's a really robust technology package. It was quite substantial. Um, and, and that leads into, you know, one of the questions of, of the event. Um, so the one o'clock programming is, I won't call it closed, but it's, it's uh, an invite one so we can contain the space for the, for the presentations. So the two o'clock on is the open house. So I just want to clarify that with everybody and anyone listening at home. Um, but the the scheduling of the building, um, it dovetails into what the school department's doing in the operation. So we intend substantial completion of that building October 22nd. Uh, and what that means for the building is the construction is done and the building is clean. There is still some punch links things, nicks in the walls, that type of a thing. Um, you know, some little sundries to be attended to, but by and large construction is done. And one of the things that <coughs> pounded into my head and everybody else on the team's head all along, starting with Victor Cristofaro in the initial uh, uh, infancy of this program, is that we need to sell the space. We need to show the space. We need people to come and see this space and, and amaze them and cause them to want to come back here. And so we don't want to finish on August 24th and open September 1st. They wanted months. They wanted six months of showcasing that building to get the interest there, to get the people, and to get the, the, the mass of people to make it what it can be, which we, we don't fear happening. But they wanted that window. So that's why as soon as substantial completion was done and we can get a temporary certificate of occupancy, we scheduled that open house um, because we could, now that we have the occupancy permit, but also to start that process of showcasing the building because it is going to be amazing. Um, the technologies will be on the wall. The classrooms will not be furnished. Uh, the FF and E process follows, but they are going to have uh, digital uh, depictions of the classroom furnishings on the walls in the various classrooms. And there'll be a floor plan. This is a draft of the floor plan that'll be handed out at the open house to help, you know, just a roadmap to guide people through the building uh, and get them where they want to be. If they have a particular interest in a particular type of a classroom or a program, they can pinpoint it and find it or it just helps them find a bathroom or, or whatever else they need to do. Um, the other aspect, again, is the, the FF and E, the furniture, fixtures, and equipment. This is substantial. I mean, it's all new equipment. We're not taking the furniture from the old buildings to this new facility. It's all new. As, as Aaron described, the process of picking it all out. Um, that's all been procured. It needs to be de delivered. It couldn't be delivered till the building was done. Uh, it needs to be set up. It needs to be distributed and, and it needs to be assembled need to be distributed and set up in the various classrooms. The technology final pieces had to be put in and plugged in and programmed. So even after construction of the building, there was significant work to be done. So we did that, that open house as soon as we can, both from a legal standpoint with the occupancy permit, but to give as much of a window in the backside as possible uh, to get all the technologies done, get the furniture done, and get the place to ready to really show for the tours and stuff that they were getting to, uh, to, to schedule. Yes. Make sure it's on. Hello. Hello. Okay. <laughs> um, I think the 
design of the building is uh, has a lot of attention to detail, but ultimately uh, it's about meeting the individual needs of the students. And I didn't quite hear it addressed how um, you're going to communicate about the IEPs. Um, as a student with a 504, I know it's different, but I find in my school, I have to do a lot of self-advocacy. And I can see that these parents are very strong advocates for their children. But if there's um, needs that aren't being met for the individual students, how are you going to be able to communicate with the parents specifically and make sure that every student has their needs met? Good question. So um, typically when students are on an IEP, we have IEP meetings, um, you know, at least once, at least once per year, sometimes more if families request it. So in terms of, you know, uh, recommendations for, um, you know, students that might be recommended to attend the learning center, that will happen through the team meeting. So, and that is when teachers or parents, if they feel that um, something isn't happening that should be happening or a child's needs are not being met, that typically happens during the IEP process. I think, you know, obviously um, parents can always call the school or call their teachers, but in general, you know, where we would discuss those individual concerns would be in that meeting. And we write pretty lengthy um, IEP documents for individual students that include any, uh, one of the big parts of it is uh, parent concerns. Um, and it's, a lot of times it's parents that are, you know, advocating for their students, as you said. So it would really happen during the individual education uh, plan meetings. I think that there will also be, you know, we'll be working on um, part of the development of the actual initial application is the programming, which will also address um, individual student needs. So we have to be prepared for that as we move into opening this building. And, and so having conversations with the parent design team um, to actually plan for what is that curricula going to look like, what are those assessments going to look like, what's that communication with families going to look like, all of that will be incorporated into the initial application. And then we will certainly share that with them with families and, you know, with anybody that's the committee, anyone that's interested as we move towards submitting that application. Thank you, Deverell. Um, not during the meeting, sir, I'm sorry. I can't at the next open forum. The next meeting. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. Okay. Here, I know he's here for all the tough questions, but I want to give him an opportunity if he, he wanted to say anything relative to his involvement in the project or anything to share. Because well, I, I know you have a wealth of insight. Pardon? I know you have a wealth of insight and expertise. Well, well thank you very much. Uh, no, I'll just say that, I mean, Paul and Aaron covered uh, a lot of ground tonight, so there's not a lot left to say. But uh, I will say that, you know, as you know, our firm was involved with the uh, Southwest Middle School. Mm -hmm. And once again, uh, with the De Cristofaro Learning Center, um, it was remarkable to us um, the, the level of experience uh, and, and commitment to the mission of the building that the city had from the very beginning until the present day. And uh, just the, the, the experience that the city has, uh, starting with the mayor's office and, and, and uh, Quincy Public Schools and Quincy Public Buildings in terms of the issues that come up. In this case, we took an older building and there were unforeseen conditions in it. Despite the best of us, we discover things as we're going along. Um, and yet the city was always there, right there on top of it to address it. Uh, we were very clear about the purpose of the building, very clear about the objectives, about the schedule and budget objectives, and more than anything about the quality, uh, which is always uh, top priority here. 
And we work for a lot of other cities and towns around the Commonwealth, you know, Springfield, Lowell, and so forth. That the experience and professionalism here is honestly unmatched. You cannot do better than what the city is doing. And I, we went through it at Southwest Middle. We run that one for five plus years. We've been on this one for uh, two and a half at least, mm -hmm. almost three. And every day, you just it's reinforced again and again. Uh, so that's the one thing that just stands out to us all the time. I think Commissioner Hines, it actually, I don't think he ever missed a meeting. I mean, we've been meeting over there for over two years. And he was not only in the meeting, but actively engaged in the meeting. Some of them were two and three hours at a given time. So that's the big thing that stands out to us. Uh, we, it's what we do for a living. Mm -hmm. uh, this city, starting with the mayor and Quincy Public Schools and Quincy Public Buildings, is just uh, really, really top of, you know, top of the shelf in terms of the way it gets done in municipal construction. There's no better anywhere. Thank you. So, yep. Hey, Coke. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I got to get over there. I have been over there since uh, many, many months uh, to check things out. Certainly, have been by the place. I did want to, uh, just for the public information, is let people know that this this project got more expensive than we first anticipated. Uh, and what we did, uh, working with the superintendent, uh, is use some ESSER money for a portion of the building, which is the federal money. Uh, we also, those that don't know, counties around the country got APRA money as well. County government and a lot of other parts of the government are, I mean, part of the country, are the, the whole government, if you will. Uh, this part of the country is, is municipal control, really. But so that APRA money that went to the county, we applied for, and we got $8.7 million towards this building. Um, so we want to thank the county commissioners, Congressman Lynch, and our partners at the federal level, and as well as the city council for supporting this project from day one. We've been involved in a lot of projects as a committee, a lot of schools, uh, a lot of improvements. This truly is a very, very special one. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the day when the kids are filling that building. I just had uh, one comment, Paul. I think I made a mention to you personally, but the mechanical on the top of that building drives me crazy. Can we somehow uh, mute that, <laughs> whether it's painted or? Oh, I, I thought of having the same muralist come up with a design on it, a like hundred caterpillar or something. Yeah. Okay. That was yeah. unfortunately one of the results of consolidating the mechanicals to not appeal to the classrooms, mm -hmm. that the few that we had were bigger. But that one's a monster. Outstanding presentation. Great work. And I know uh, you, you said it, you hit it on the head, Tom. We've, we've, we've got an incredible team. I think what was extra special in this one, the assistant superintendent's experience in this world yeah. uh, and her team really made the difference. And though, you know, I, in the conversations we had, it was a transition we started with Dr. DeCristofaro and, and um, Kevin and Aaron quickly reminded me that, uh, you know, you just can't back this into the building. We, we have to build it out uh, for a specific space. We've got to be competitive, uh, which eventually drove the cost up. But it's the right way to do it. So just an extra thanks to Aaron. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Okay, we're going to item B, QPS Spring 2023. MCAS accountability data. Ms. Perkins, Mr. Marani, Ms. Quinn, Mr. Danny, and Ms. Vaughn. We'll have a brief recess for the change. Okay, we're back in session. Item B, QPS. Spring 2023, MCAS and accountability data. We have Ms. Perkins, Mr. Marani, Ms. Quinn, Mr. Tierney, and Ms. Vaughn to present. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, we are thrilled to be here tonight to present on our uh, accountability data and uh, share with you some of our goals for the 23-24 school year. Um, just before I turn it over, I'm so fortunate to work with an unbelievably phenomenal curriculum and assessment team, 
We have been meeting for weeks, pouring over this data. I think um, in general, we're pleased with the data. You know, I think that there are some areas that we're obviously still concerned with. Um, but I think in general, we see some good signs of recovery. We're very pleased with how our schools performed uh, on, on the uh, MCAS assessment. And I know the superintendent mentioned it, I think, at the last meeting. But obviously, we want to recognize Montclair School, which is a school of recognition. So we're very, very um, proud of how our schools performed last year, especially given all of the things that you know our students and our staff have had to deal with over the past few years. So uh, before I turn it over um, to continue on with the presentation, just, um, I can, oh, sorry. Go ahead, write that, sorry. Um, just uh, to let you know a couple of things that um, ha are happening in, at the state level. So 2023 represents a full return to the accountability system. So back to the accountability system that was in place prior to COVID-19. So um, what the state is telling us is to not compare 2023 percentiles to the percentiles from 2012 to 2017. So this is a new baseline, a new set of data, and it's not something that we should be comparing to the old accountability system. Um, and that we, you should, we should be using caution when comparing 2023 to 2018, 2019, or 2022. So this is definitely a new baseline. Some of the indicators were absolutely impacted by COVID and after COVID, and some of the metrics changed. For, insta for instance, chronic absenteeism in, I think, 2022 was 20% of absent, um, you know, uh, absences, and now it's 10%. So, and, but that's all figured into their equation, which makes it difficult to pr uh, compare to years before uh, 2023. So in general, the 2023 data across the state indicates that we are beginning to recover. So in general, the state it has seen signs of recovery in both ELA and mathematics. Um, one of the things that uh, I think that we have seen in Quincy and is also you know, kind of trending within the state is that the grade three results do signal a need to remain cautious uh, about, in particular, the incoming testing grades. So those students in grade three you know, when they were in kindergarten and they were just starting school, education was very interrupted for them. And those are when really crucial skills are learned in terms of reading and foundational skills and mathematics. Um, and so, you know, that grade in particular, and I think we see it definitely in our data as well, is an area of concern and an area that we definitely need to focus on. And in general, um, just that there is still a lot of work to be done to recover from the impact of the interrupted education that we experienced during the pandemic and then after. Um, but I think that we have some some really great things happening in Quincy in particular. Uh, we're, we're proud of how our students and our staff, you know, are doing and did in last year's uh, MCAS. And with that, I will turn it over to... Chris, to talk about the accountability data. Thank you, Ms. Perkins. Uh, good evening. Uh, tonight I'll be taking you through our accountability data, which was released in late September. Um, as Ms. Perkins uh, mentioned, this year marks the first year uh, since the pandemic where progress towards targets have been measured and an overall school uh, accountability percentile was issued. Uh, please note that districts are not given an accountability percentile. Uh, the accountability system is comprised of uh, these five indicators, which you see here. Uh, achievement, specifically the average scaled score uh, in ELA, math, and science. The average uh, SGP in ELA and math and student growth. The four-year graduation rate, extended engagement, and annual dropout rate for high school completion. Progress made on access testing uh, for English language proficiency. And lastly, the chronic absenteeism rate. Uh, each of these indicators uh, have a target set by DESE. Uh, these schools have in the, uh, the schools have individual targets, and the district has individual targets as well. Uh, for these targets, DESE assigns uh, zero to four points. Uh, these are exceeding exceeded target four points, met target three points, improved below target two points. Uh, no change, one point, or declined, which is zero points. So 
Student growth points are awarded differently from target achievement points. The goal or target that the state has set forth for all district schools and student groups is to achieve or exceed an SGP of 50. SGPs are not calculated for science. The points earned for each indicator are combined, weighted, and calculated into an overall percentage, which represents our progress towards targets. With that said, the district has been given an overall classification of not requiring assistance or intervention, as we have been identified as making substantial progress towards targets. Now we will be reviewing each indicator that contributed to the district's substantial progress toward targets classification for both high school and non-high school. First up for high school is the four-year graduation rate. We're pleased that our students overall have exceeded the target and that seven out of eight student groups have improved from the prior year. And just a reminder that this data is lagged a year, which is why 2022 is the most recent year shown here. For the annual dropout rate, we experienced a slight 0.1% uptick from 21 to 22. Again, the results uh, for the annual dropout rate lag a year behind. For high school chronic absenteeism, which is defined as missing 10% or more days of school, we see that the district has exceeded the overall target and exceeded in six of the nine subgroups. In advanced coursework completion, we did not meet our target, but we did improve overall, as well as improving in six of the nine subgroups. Some of the courses that contribute to this figure besides uh, advanced courses include Project Lead the Way, Dual Enrollment for Post-Secondary Credit, Chapter 74 Approved Vocational Technical Secondary Cooperative Education Programs in Articulation Agreement Courses, and other, and other DESE Selected Rigorous Courses. For ELA, high school students experience typical low growth overall, with the exception of Asian and multi-race non-Hispanic students who were awarded three points for typical high growth. In high school math, students overall experience typical high growth, including four out of nine subgroups. For progress toward toward attaining English language proficiency, there was a, a decline, which is why this indicator will be a district goal for this year. Now moving on to uh, non-high school accountability, we're very pleased that the district has exceeded the target and nine out of 10 subgroups improved from last year. Here we see overall high growth, including eight of our subgroups in ELA. In math, we see a high typical growth overall with a mix of growth points in our subgroups, including exceeding growth in our Asian subgroup. For non-high school progress towards attaining EL proficiency, we see two percentage point decline, which again is why this indicator will be a district goal for this year. Finally, we have our MCAS participation. Here we, we can see that Quincy's MCAS participation was, was greater than or equal to the state's participation in every grade. At this time, I'll be turning the presentation over to Ms. Perkins to discuss the district's English language proficiency goal. Thank you, Chris. And uh, you'll hear Ms. Wojcik will also talk about this in her program improvement plan as well. But um, one of the things we noticed when that we were concerned about when we looked at the data was the drop in the progress towards proficiency for our EL students, in particular, the students at the high school level. Um, but the students in K to, or one to eight also had plateaued. So they didn't decrease significantly, but they also have not increased. And so uh, as we talked about this as a team, we really felt like this needed to be a really concerted effort with all of us, not just the um, English language learner department, that we all needed to help support this. And so we developed a goal 
that uh, for the district that we would um, focus on students in grades 1 to 12 and we would set some targets, uh, our, some goals for ourselves in terms of um, what we would like to see them increase in their proficiency targets. So for students in grades 9 to 12, we have a goal of increasing 10% from a base of 21.9. And the reason we selected 10% was because although that is not going to get us to our target, it, it, it will get us significant progress towards our target. So I think to get to the target, it was, you know, 15 or 16 percentage points. Uh, we felt like 10% was a reasonable amount that, you know, we could aim for uh, for this next this current school year. And in grades uh, one through eight, it's 6.9% um, increase from a base of 56.9. And this was based on what the target is for grades uh, one through eight. So just some um, action steps. We have, uh, Chris has done an amazing job dissecting the data. We really want to know who these students are, what happened, you know, why, why are we not seeing uh, more growth in, ter in terms of their proficiency targets. So we um, have uh, we have been reviewing the targets and the data, and as you know, we've en identified a goal. Um, Heather has met with the EL teachers uh, to draft their student support plans. Um, and we are also creating a, a district team that will create action plans for the individual sites to assist in meeting proficiency targets. So we'll be, we'll be meeting with them, reviewing their data, going through the data, and meeting periodically throughout the year to track uh, progress towards those proficiency targets. Um, and we will be looking at things like historical data, individual student data, and student participation data because we want to make sure that our kids are there and that they're taking the test and that we're not um, losing points because students have not taken the test. Um, and so um, the, the district proficiency target team, as I said, will meet with individual sites. And uh, the... the Currently, the EL teachers have put together the student success plans, the drafts, Heather's reviewing the drafts. Those drafts will be sent out to families in November. Um, and then during the school year, elementary and middle school EL educators are also working on piloting new curriculum materials and making final recommendations in terms of curriculum materials, which will also help you know, increase, um, giving kids good materials will help increase proficiency targets. And um, we will review attendance data and include the family liaisons as necessary to improve attendance and participation during the school year. So as I said, um, we have students in class so that they can make progress. And um, all of our EL educators keep documentation and monitor progress and we'll review that progress towards our ind individual proficiency targets. Thank you. Good evening. I have the pleasure of sharing tonight with you um, a reflection of our district math goals as well as looking ahead to this coming school year. So last year our district um, MCAS goal and superintendent leadership goal was to increase three achievement percentage points in the meeting and exceeding category um, on the spring 2022 achievement distribution by year report. The chart before you shows the, M, the math MCAS achievement percentages comparing the 2022 to 2023 district data by cohort. So here we're comp comparing the same students um, to how they did the year prior. You can see that we achieved our goal in grades four, six, and eight. And we're very pleased with our increase of over 3% in grades six and eight, as well as um, an over 5% increase in grade four. Grade seven, um, five and seven results are an area of concern as our meeting and exceeding expectations did decrease um, between the 22-23 school year. In our next slide, we look at the data and compare each grade to the prior year using the um, MCAS achievement percentage comparing 22 to 23 district data and state data. Here, if we look at grades five and seven, we have an increase of 5.3% and 6.5% respectively. We also saw slight increases in grades four and 10, and all percentages were higher than the state. By looking at the data in both ways, 
we can see that growth is occurring while also realizing that we still have more work to do. Before I dive into the math map results, I want to remind everyone as the grade levels increase, the RIT growth decreases. So which is why we have different goals for each um, for various grade levels. So last year, our district map goals were to increase, um, were to see an increase of 10 RIP points from fall to spring for grade two, eight for three and four, and five RIP points for grades five and eight. This graph shows the average math RIT growth in grades three to eight. Each bar comparison represents grade level growth in MAP from fall to spring, with the blue bar showing the fall and the red showing the spring. And I'm thrilled to report that for the 20, for the 2022, 23 school year, we not only saw growth in every grade, but we exceeded our goals in all um, grade levels. So in preparation for this year's math goals, we took a look at the MCAS data by question type and domain. We immediately noticed an area of need in constructive response questions. These question types have multiple parts and, we, and required the students to show and explain their work. Across the grades, this is an area of concern and has become the focus of our first math goal. So during the 2023-24 school year, students in grades three to eight will show evidence of achievement in mathematics as measured by a total increase of two achievement percentage points in constructive response questions. And that will be shown by the spring 2024 district results by standards report. Given that we not only met our MAP goals, but significantly increased them in grades two and three, we have increased um, those RIC goals for this coming um, year in those grades. So our new goal during um, this next school year, students in grades two to eight will show evidence of growth in math as measured by the following increases in RIP points. 12 RIP points from fall to spring in grade two, 10 RIP points for grade three, an increase of eight RIP points for grade four, and five RIP points for grades five and eight. Taking a look at our action steps, our focus for K-5 to continues to be the implementation of illustrative mathematics. We are delighted to have IM consultant Maureen O'Connell with us, supporting all the K-5 to teachers in the implementation and pacing of illustrative mathematics. Maureen is providing targeted in-house professional development, focusing on the needs of each school and the individual grade levels. We're thrilled to have two new members of our math team, we now have a math specialist at Point Webster and Southwest Middle School. We can't thank the school committee enough um, who are instrumental in making this happen. We are so fortunate to have your support in expanding this valuable team. We are all, they are already supporting teachers with the implementation and pacing of the curriculum, monitoring the progress of the students using ST Math, and working with small groups of identified students on targeted instruction. Guided math centers and number talks will continue to be an important part of building fluency and number sense. And teams will be established to update the pacing guides to ensure that all topics are addressed before the MCAS exam in May. Particular attention will be paid to weaving in geometry, measurement, and data topics, since historically these standards are addressed in the last units of our program, and as a result, our domains that we scored what we're in. So last year, I shared that the 1-8 grant um, that sixth and seventh graders at Point Webster and Southwest will have the opportunity to use um, the digital program ST Math. Since then, DESE has awarded us a grant that will help fund us to use ST Math for the fourth graders at Lincoln Hancock, Clifford Marshall, and Snug Harbor. And then as an added bonus, Mind Education, the creators of ST Math, um, are allowing all grade levels within these three schools to access the program at no additional cost. We're pleased to have math consultant Molly Vokey back with us to work with our middle school math teachers. Ms. Vokey will kick off our dive into building thinking classrooms during our November 17th Professional Development Day. And this will be our focus um, throughout the, the year with our middle school math teachers. Ms. Vokey will also be working closely with Southwest math teachers. Throughout the year, she will work with them on planning and executing lessons. 
administering formative assessments and using the results to inform instruction, as well as continue the work of incorporating the practices of building thinking classrooms. And finally, number talks will continue to be utilized weekly to help students continue to build number sense and fluency. And I'll now pass the presentation over to Mike Morani, who will discuss the science. Thank you, Ms. Quinn. Good evening, everyone. Shifting gears from math to science, I'd like to begin with the previous school year's uh, STE goal. To summarize it, we focused in on grade five. We were aiming for a three percentage point increase in the exceeding or meeting expectations achievement categories. This was obviously within the spring 2023 MCAS results. So though this three-point increase uh, was not achieved as the data indicates, I'm pleased to report that we did see a positive uh, movement in two out of the three assessed grade levels. As you can see, grade five increased 1.4%, grade eight did decrease uh, at 3.7%, and grade 10 increased 2.5%. One item I would like to note is, though the MCAS isn't necessarily a cohort-based comparison, it does give us some insight into how we as a district um, perform compared to the state average. Uh, to that end, if you look at the state data there, you'll see that uh, all of our results at all three grade levels exceeded uh, the state averages across the board. From here? Okay. Shifting gears a little bit to now when we look at map data, we can focus in on our cohorts of students as we look at students year to year. And map, uh, the map benchmark system is a great way uh, to monitor the changes, the progress uh, that cohorts make. So with this in mind, uh, our goal, uh, again, within science was a 4.5 RIT point increase from the fall average to spring for students in grades four and five, and a four point RIT increase again from fall to spring for students in grades six through eight. And so when we look at the results, though we did fall short in grades six and seven, uh, all five grade levels showed strong growth when comparing fall writ results to spring. So more specifically in grade four, there was a 5.4%, excuse me, 5.4 point increase, grade five, 5.2, grade six, 3.7, grade seven, 3.4, and grade eight, 4.2. That indicates at grades four, five, and eight, we were able to be successful in the achievement of that goal. From a question type and standards-based standpoint, we don't see too many areas of concern. However, uh, as Ms. Quinn noted in the math presentation, I think an area to note is the constructed response question type. Each had a percent of possible points below 50%, which when compared to the other data uh, presented, it does differ somewhat uh, across the domains noted at both grade five and grade eight. Our action steps, um, we have eight core action steps, uh, but with that data reflection in mind, it's important to recognize that though uh, we're focusing our district goals on other content areas, we still have plenty of work to do uh, within science um, areas across uh, all grade levels. So just to highlight a few of these action steps, um, we want to uh, attend trainings and research opportunities to best understand and effectively implement the upcoming expanded STE pilot. And again, that's for all students in grades five to eight. So that's an important part of this year is learning more about what that pilot can teach us about this test, because as we shift beyond this year, uh, we'll transition uh, to that full test. So just as a reminder, the STE pilot uh, has a session one, which is the legacy test, a session two this year, which is the pilot test. So when we look at data next year, we'll be looking at session one uh, data. So that's something just to consider as we move forward. Obviously, we want to establish um, a curriculum selection team that can make sure our curriculum is aligned with this updated testing process. So we'll be looking at that as an action step 
uh, this year. And again, there's quite a, quite a bit else going on. For the sake of time, I'll, I'll go through it pretty quickly. We have Project Lead the Way. We'll continue on. We'll provide an opportunity for all eighth grade students to investigate research uh, and participate in a STEM project. We will implement our engineering as elementary units uh, for grades three through five. We actually had a professional development session today for teachers in the implementation of that program. It's a great opportunity for our elementary students. Once again, department chairs will facilitate data analysis of the 2023 uh, MCAS results. We'll continue our partnership with Quincy College uh, to make sure students have greater access to college completion and, and the career pipeline. Uh, and finally, we will offer and facilitate a transformative STEM Ed Innovators Design Lab, which offers four workshops centered around culturally responsive teaching practices and equitable STEM pedagogy for both middle school and high school classrooms. So with that said, I'll hand it off to Ms. Vaughn to present an English language arts and reading. Thank you, Mr. Morani. Um, good evening, everyone. And in the next set of slides, I'll be sharing with you a reflection on last year's English language arts district data and goals, and then we'll follow with our new goals and action steps for this school year. So our achievement goal for last year was that during the 2022-23 school year, students in grades three to eight will show evidence of achievement in ELA as measured by an increase of two achievement percentage points in exceeding or meeting achievement performance levels from spring 2022, as evidenced by the 23 PE305 MCAS achievement distribution by year report. So when um, analyzing these results of the same groups of students in 2022 and 2023, we see a drop in grades three, four, and five. These students are currently in grades five, six, and seven. Our 2022 grades six and seven students had significant growth last year uh, while they were in grades seven and eight and met our goal. These students are now in grades eight and nine, respectively. Um, so this chart shows the grade level achievement percentages for exceeding and meeting performance levels on MCAS. Um, here you can see that there were some drops in percentages uh, from 2022 in grades five, seven, and 10 of about two to three, roughly two to three percent. Grade three had the most significant drop of 5.9 percent, um, which goes right along with what Ms. Perkins was discussing earlier. Um, grade six and eight had increases of 0.2 and 1.3 percent, and in grade four, we met and exceeded our goal with an increase of 3.6 percent. We dipped below state percentages in grades five and six, but maintained percentages in ELA MCAS achievement above the state in all other grade levels. Oh. So um, we'll turn to reflecting on our ELA growth with the NWEA map reading assessment um, during 2022-23 school year. Students in grades two to eight will show evidence of growth in reading as measured by the following increases in RIT points um, in the spring 23 map district, student, map district student growth and summary report. 10 RIT points above the fall average for grade two, five for grades three and four, and three RIT points above the fall average for grades five through eight. So each bar graph comparison here represents grade level growth in MAP from fall to spring with blue representing um, the fall and the red bar showing spring. Um, in reading, we're happy to report that all grade levels had growth. Um, we, our, we exceeded our goal in grade two with an increase of 13.4 um, RIT points. Uh, we doubled in grade three uh, from five, we, we increased by 11.2, and we met the goal in grade four, also with an increase of 6.6. In um, grade five, we also met the goal with an increase of 4.2. Uh, we just missed it in grade six um, and seven, but um, we still grew in every single grade level with just not meeting that, um, that writ point goal. So in addition to looking at overall growth and achievement, another very important aspect to analyze and reflect upon is how we performed on question types and in, in the domains of language, reading, and writing. Um, here, 
it is clear that continued improvement is needed in writing across all grade levels, and that has, is what has influenced the development of the goals for this school year. So our, the new district ELA achievement goal is connected directly to writing. During the 2023-24 school year, students in grades three to eight will show evidence of achievement in ELA as measured by a 2% increase in percent possible points in writing, as evidenced by the spring 23 CU 306 MCAS district results by standards report. This is sort of different, a different report that we're measuring specifically for writing um, this year, for next year. In the bar graph below this goal, you can see that last year in writing, we did improve our percent possible points in almost every grade level, but we'd like to continue this upward trend so that we can see further improvement in the domain cluster of production and distribution in writing. Our new uh, MAP growth goal with NWEA is during the 23-24 school year, students in grades two to eight will show evidence of growth in reading as measured by the following increases uh, in writ points indicated in the spring 23-24 MAP district student growth summary report. Um, so you'll notice that we have bumped this up a bit since we achieved all of our, or most of our goals in MAP last year, um, we've, we've bumped this up to 12 writ points um, above the fall average in grade two. We're doubling it in grade three. Um, we feel that we can meet this challenge and um, rise above it to 10 writ points, five writ points in grade four, and three in grades five through eight. A summary of our ELA targeted action steps are as follows. To comply with the new DZ early literacy screening regulations, we'll be screening all students in grades K through three. Uh, we just finished our beginning of year screening assessments with all students sharing results with all families, and providing an action plan for those students who have not yet met relevant benchmarks. To align with our district goals in writing, we have formed an ELA rubric and assessment team. This team will analyze, amplify core knowledge language arts assessments, making sure that all types of writing that is assessed on MCAS is practiced throughout the year in K-5. to Also in K-5, to we're in year three of the federally funded GLEAM Continuation Grant, and we thank you for your support with this effort. Um, this brings us into the DESE phase two of implementing high quality instructional materials. This phase transitions us from routine use of these culturally responsive practices in ELA to refinement, maximizing student learning and keeping equity at the forefront of our ELA vision. In all grades, Educators will continue to strengthen students' abilities to ident identify key ideas and details by building knowledge with close reading of complex text. And in grades six, to, six through eight, again, to align with the district goals, we'll take a closer look at the implementation of common writing assessments and be sure that these are rigorous enough, both in complexity and frequency. And I will pass it back over to Ms. Perkins. Thank you very much. So I just want to thank the curriculum team. Um, they've worked really hard on analyzing all this data and developing those action steps and goals. Um, you'll hear a little bit more specific information in their program improvement plans and also then in the school improvement plans, which is what we're working on right now. We have assessment days, uh, one that just happened at the middle school level and the elementary school level coming up on uh, October 25th. There are department meetings, uh, vertical and grade level team meetings that are happening across the district. The integrated learning team meetings take place, will be taking place in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then student support team meetings. As I mentioned, you'll be getting a lot of presentations in terms of program improvement plans and school improvement plans with uh, lots of great data for them to share with you. Uh, and then as we move through the year, we'll be monitoring our progress and reflecting on how we're doing uh, so that we can work towards meeting our goals and moving on to that, the next step, hopefully next year. And so with that, uh, we'll answer any questions. Thank you so much. This is uh, arduous to get through, to tell you. I really, it's, it's difficult for me. It really is difficult for me. There's so many things going back and forth with the data, but I really appreciate it.
And um, I really appreciate the work that you guys have done to try to break it down for us and show us where our needs are and what we're doing about it. I have one question for Ms. Milani. I don't see the science, technology, or engineering goal for 23-24. I see your action steps, but I don't see a new goal. Yep, so we decided to shift our focus to math, ELA, and EL as our goals. So I just wanted to point out the action steps that we're still taking within science, though we don't have a specific goal assigned to that. Okay. It certainly could be uh, focused within school improvement plans uh, as well, but from a district perspective, uh, we're moving away from that because, again, we have that expanded pilot test um, that we need to learn more about. Yes, yeah. yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is really, some of the goals really, are they're, they're ambitious, and I think that's wonderful. I really do. I think it's wonderful to be ambitious with these goals. I know I've said this a million times, but I'm much happier with the MAP data than I am with the MCAS data. I mean, it's actionable. It's um, stuff we can work with. I, I know we tried to look at the cohort from last year that was, and, you know, it's just, it's very hard. The, the way the MCAS is administered, I think, is very difficult for us to be actionable. Um, as a district, perhaps, but on a student's basis, it's, it's really a bit not so great. So I really like the, um, the MAP data much better. Just me on my soapbox. Sorry Thank about you. that. What jumps out at me is the um, is what Aaron led off with, with our third grade kiddos, and what happened to them, with not being able to uh, participate in in-person learning. Um, in 2020, in February, and March, I sat here and I said K through three should be in school. There's no evidence that they uh, are going to contract this virus, and if they do, it's going to be very mild. Now they're paying the price for it, and it's really sad, and I'm really angry about it because these are our kids that have, been, that have paid the price for this incompetence at the federal and state level. So it's not a reflection on any of you, but it is a reflection on the people who were in charge um, and who made these decisions uh, without data. They made up data. So um, I'm just upset about it and uh, I, I and our kids are paying the price for it and I, I it's uh, I hope we can re remediate them somewhere along the line and continue to to push stuff to, um, towards them so that they can hopefully catch up and that's going to be a, a long road I think just a couple of questions go ahead was it Amy? Okay. Uh, so when I look at the map math growth and the science growth, from spring to fall, there's a drop off. So. I get that you're trying to get the growth from fall to spring, but are we doing something so that I'm not saying I'm not accusing you of any corruption, but why is there a <laughs> drop off when yeah. that's a good question. So that actually is that does happen with the map data. So when students take the um the test at the end of the school year to the fall over the summer. They're definitely, we see it every year. There is a drop in scores when they enter in the fall. And we do offer like summer programs and things like that to try to help remediate that. But it, it's actually typical with the MAP uh, data for it to be a little lower in the fall than, it, than where they left off in the spring. Um, so is that, should we be doing something to combat that or should we? is my question kind of, should we administer the fall test like slightly later? So, but then then it gets into you're teaching something that's already, I get that, That's saying. right, so that you got it, you hit the nail on the head. So the reason that we don't do that is because we need to have so many weeks of instruction in order to kind of get a pure sample as to how the students are performing. Otherwise, if teachers have introduced something then it's, it's, you don't know, did they, you know, was it because the teacher introduced it or was it, um, did they actually know it, you know, so, 
So that's why we, we actually want to do it when we haven't really done a whole lot of instruction so we know exactly where the students are and what they're ready to learn. Um, and then my second point was, I'm sure you've probably heard it, but should we move beyond teaching to, to the test? Um, I, my former biology teacher, she wrote for doctoral, like a 30-page paper all about this with lots of research. And it's essentially that all of this is test data, and it's great. But is there, obviously, if you move beyond teaching to the test, these are standards set by like state and federal, so you really can't. But are you going to take those considerations in? Yeah, I think that what we encourage, we use it, and you know, we're talking about it tonight. But I think, like Miss Lebo um, said, you know, what we really encourage people to use is the map data in our district, which is it allows us to progress monitor students. And and for us, it's you know, MCAS is a thing. This the state does it. We we use the data to help us, you know, determine what we need to focus on, especially as a district. Um, you know, and, it, and it's good to reflect on, right, from the year before. But for us, it's about the standards. So, you know, really, you know, teaching, we want students at the end of the year to have mastered the standards. And, um, you know, and that, that's, you know, the MCAS helps us, I guess, assess that. But for us, as Ms. Lebo said, I think our preferred uh, assessment method is the MAP assessment where we can actually look at it multiple times a year. We can, there's a whole learning continuum that tells us exactly where kids are performing on the standards and what they, what they need to know in order to progress. Kids can set their own goals using the map. So we, um, we absolutely prefer that. And, and I would say that we encourage our teachers and our staff to, you know, teach the standards, not the test. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just one question. Is there a way to separate new students to our school system that don't meet the targets? Do we do that? So we can we can tease out the data. Um, in in some cases, students have to have been with us for. It depends on what target it is. So sometimes, in some instances, students have to have been with us for two years. So they're not necessarily new. Um, like for instance, the LPS indicator. Students have to be with us for two years. Um, for EL proficiency, they have to have, I, I believe they have to actually have been with us for two years. Um, right, Chris? For, for the English language proficiency target, um, they actually have had to have tested with us on the access two years in a row. Thank you very much. We're all set, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, item C, MASE convention resolutions will be voting on October 25th. Mrs. Hughley. Thank you. Um, on November 8th, I will be attending the Mass Association <clears throat> School Committee's Delegate Assembly. In your packets, you all have a copy of the resolutions. Um, on October 25th, at that meeting, we will be going over the resolutions and then taking a vote on how you as a committee you'd like me to vote at the delegate assembly. So I'm just pointing out that these are in your packets and we will go over them at that time. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Hughley. Superintendent, item D. Thank you. Um, there is a, a grant that um, I would request your approval on for the 2023-2024 school year. $10,000 in funding has been granted by the Abella Foundation. 2000 to each middle school to support extended day activities if we could have a motion to approve. The motion of Mr. Procoli, seconded by Mrs. Lebo. We approve. I think we Superintendent. I think we have to do a roll call for that? Yes. Sir. We'd have to do a roll call? Yes. Uh, Mr. Bergoli. Yes. Mrs. Cahill. Yes. Mr. Gattro. Yes. Mrs. Hubley. Yes. Mrs. Lebo. Yes. Mrs. Santoro. Yes. And Mayor Koch. Item E, Superintendent. Uh, this is a grant. Uh, the Patelli Foundation is funding field trips to Holly Hill Farm in Cohasset for all grade five students to learn about local ecosystems. This is valued at $10,000. If we could have a motion to approve the grant. And motion, Mrs. Lebo. Seconded by Mrs. Hubley. Superintendent Collar. Mr. Bergoli? Yes. Mrs. Cahill? Yes. Mr. Gattro? Yes. Mrs. Hubley? Yes. Mrs. Lebo? Yes. Mrs. Santoro? Yes. And Maya Koch. Item F, Superintendent. 
uh, for the 2023-2024 school year. This is a grant the Quincy School Community Partners have donated $100,476.23 as detailed in the list provided in your packet. These donations fund a number of initiatives, including educator mini-grants, the mentor program, the student leadership summits, and the robotics programs, just to name a few. If we could have a motion to approve. A motion to Mrs. Hubley, seconded by Mr. Catro. Superintendent. Mr. Bregoli. Yes. Mrs. Cahill. Yes. Mr. Gatro. Yes. Mrs. Hubley. Yes. Mrs. Lebo. Yes. Mrs. Santoro. Yes. And Mayor Cope. Thank you. Madam G. Uh, we have an overnight travel uh, trip to um, from Quincy High School grade 1 to 10 to the Yale Model Congress, Yale University, New Haven, Connecticut. On a motion, Mr. Gatro. Seconded by Mrs. Cahill. Superintendent Carl. A voice vote is fine. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Item H. Uh, this is an overnight travel. Uh, the to the on from December seventh uh, to December eighth, twenty twenty three. Uh, the Decca High School Business Career Development Competition, Seacrest Hotel, Falmouth, Massachusetts. On a motion of Mrs. Cahill, seconded by Mr. Bergoli. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed. The ayes have it. Thank you. Okay. Item I. Transitioning to electric vehicles and charging infrastructure is a referred to facilities, transportation, and security by Mr. Catro. Do you wish to comment, Mr. Catro? Yep, we'll discuss it in committee. Okay, so moved. Item J, UPS recycling update, current status, training, and metrics referred by Mr. Catro to facilities transportation, and security. Speaks for itself. So be it. I see no additional business. Upcoming school committee meetings, October 25th, November 15, December 13, all 6.30 here at Cardington. Upcoming subcommittees, October 18, we have the quarterly budget and finance at 6 o'clock the policy at 6.30. Seeing no subcommittee reports, I'll take a motion to go into executive session. I have no executive session needed. Not needed today. Need Forget that. <laughs> take a motion to, ex motion to adjourn. Adjourned. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you all. Thank you.